All right, picking up from last week. As a quick reminder, we dropped off uh, just before I started talking about partitions. Uh, you guys should have learned about partitions and computer essentials. Uh, if you don't remember, Google is your friend. Um, however, just as a quick little definition to refresh everybody, a partition is a way to divide a hard disk into smaller chunks. Nowadays, file systems are res resilient enough to survive on a very large disk. <coughs> there once was a time where it didn't work so well, where computers had a problem with partitions greater than 200 megabytes. Yes, more than 200 megabytes, the computer was not a happy, part uh, happy customer, so you divided your hard drive into partitions. The way the partition table is arranged, and it's actually covered a little bit further in the slides, is the, one of the very first things on a disk is a special sector called the, the uh, partition table. And in the partition table, it allows for three primary part, uh, four primary partitions or three primaries and one extended partition. Extended partitions was a way that allowed us to have many partitions on a large disk. Um, so an extended partition allows for logical, they call logical partitions, also known as logical drives. On Linux, when you look for them, they're represented by usually SD. Unless you have a really, really old computer, then they're represented with HD. So it'd be HDD1 and HDD2 and uh, actually be HDA1, HDB2, that kind of thing. Um, those were the computers with the PATA connectors, the big, wide connectors pre-serial ATA. Uh, we're going back a few years. And for those of you that want to know what it looks like, if I were to look inside my dev f folder, there's SDA, 1, 2, and 5, and SDB. And SDB is my second disk. There's no partitions on it yet, so thus there's no numbered partitions. SDA is the disk. 1, 2, and 5 are the partitions. 1 and 2 are primary partitions, and 5 is the extended partition. Anything above five ends up being a logical drive. So if ever you get to a question that asks you, how many primary partitions and how many extended partitions? One, two, three, four are primaries. Five is extended and everything above five is logical. How else do you know this? That is how you know it. Surprise. It's not meant to be user friendly. So. Although I did say SDA5 shows up as the extended partition, depending on which version or which kernel of Linux you're running, it may show up as one of the first four partitions, and then five and up will also show up as logical drives. Uh, it's just a quirk. Not much you can do about it. Um, however, you're only allowed to have four primary partitions and only one extended partition, but considering you're only allowed four real partitions, if you have an extended, that means you have three primaries. So that's how the math works. Um, the master boot sector contains the disk partition table. Uh, it can hold up to four entries, although this has changed a little bit because of the way Microsoft has changed things with secure boot. Um, this is true for hard drives that have a master boot record. The new GPT tables, the GPT partitions don't have one of these. So if you buy a brand new computer that ships with Windows 10 on it, it's not going to have a master boot sector. It has something else, and it's the, the GPT table. Uh, it's significantly more challenging to work with because it's encrypted. Which is good. That means viruses can't take over your master boot record, which used to be a common way for viruses to stay resilient between reinstalls of Windows. You could wipe Windows and virus is still there because it was hiding in the boot record. <coughs> now, each partition table entry has four things in it. The first cylinder, the last cylinder, and this, these, this terminology is getting a little strange um, considering uh, 
SSDs don't have cylinders. <coughs> These cylinders, if you think about the old hard drives with the round disks, the cylinders go from the inside to the outside. And what it would mark is it's on, you know, anybody here remember vinyls? Vinyl records? You know when you look at the vinyl records, you can actually see the lines. Hard drives are more or less the same way, except the lines weren't interconnected to each other. But basically, you had a line looks like an onion. And the way this works is it says, this is the first string of the onion. This is the last string of the onion where this partition exists in. So that's the first cylinder and the last cylinder. Uh, the next thing it contains is whether or not it can be booted off of. If you don't have a bootable partition, the computer doesn't know what to do with it. And the last one is a file, a syst file system type identifier. Uh, it's a hex value. Um, that basically tells the OS this is the kind of partition this is. And most OSs only can read a specific subset of those types. So when the OS boots up, it then scans the partition table again to see what partitions are available to it. If it sees partition types it doesn't know, it just assumes it can't read them. Uh, if ever you've tried to access a Mac drive using a Windows computer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You need special tools to do that. Or you're trying to access a Linux hard drive with Windows. You're going to have the same problem. So you're not going to have a good time. Uh, on the other hand, you take any of those other hard drives and you plug them into a Linux machine that usually knows what to do with it. So a partition in the partition table can either be a primary partition or an extended partition. There can only be one of those. Uh, the first partition on the drive is usually the primary partition although that's a little misleading nowadays. Uh, because if you look at your partitions on a Windows machine, you'll see here that here's my breakdown of my partitions on my computer. And this is my primary partition. This is the first partition. So normally, the primary partition is the first partition that's actually bootable. For example, this one here is not a bootable partition. Although on the quiz, it's based on the wording on these slides, not what I'm saying out loud. Uh, one of the four partition entries can be designated as an extended partition. That allows you to create logical drives, also known as subpartitions or logical partitions. So essentially you create, so if picture your hard drive as a house or an office building. Each partition is a, you know, a division of the office. And the logical partitions are the cubicle farm, where you take a room and you divide it into smaller chunks. Um, they behave exactly like a normal um, partition as far as the OS is concerned, but uh, they're not primary partitions. They can't be booted off of. Um, Usually you can't. Uh, there's limits of what you can do with it also. So Linux requires two partitions to exist properly. There must be a root partition. So when you guys play around on Linux and you go to slash the root of the OS, that is actually known as the root partition. You're actually at the root, at the primary partition of the OS, which also happens to be at the base of the OS's file system. And um, this this is where the kernel usually lives, and that's where basically the rest of the OS lives. Uh, there's only ever a one root file system under Linux. You cannot have more than one root file system because you can only have one root. Otherwise, you know, how can you have two roots? At that point, you'd never have a bottom, so you still will have need to have a bottom somewhere. Uh, normally, it's exe2, 3, or 4, although there are other file systems for you to pick from. Uh, for a while, there was one called Riser. Riser was great until the guy was charged with murdering his wife and everybody dropped it like a hot potato. Uh, there's OCFS, which is from Oracle. There's ZFS, which is from Sun, which was bought by Oracle. So I guess that one's also from Oracle. Um, ZFS is by far superior to ext 2, 3, and 4, but most Linux kernels can't boot off of it. Um, there is no real limitation to the size of the partition or the size of the hard drive it can reside on. 
Um, the amount of room you need depends on what you plan to put into it. So, you know, if you're a single person, you don't need a 5,000 square foot house. Because most people don't need a 5,000 square foot house for one person. It's a little excessive. But by the same token, if you've got all the stuff, you'll need that much room. And then there's the swap partition. The swap partition is the equivalent of the Windows paging file. When you run out of RAM, the computer uses that as temporary RAM storage. Usually, you do it two to three times the amount of physical RAM you have in your machine. So if your machine has 16 gigs of RAM, you'll want it to be 32 gigs, you know, 48 gigs of RAM, uh, 48 gigs of disk space. Um, essentially, it's so that you have enough room to swap everything out. It has to be a Linux file s a swap file system. It's used as virtual memory. So if you have a big program that uses lots of RAM and you have other processes running in memory, those other processes get suspended and basically their active memory gets copied to the disk, freeing up RAM for the RAM intensive process. Um, this used to be really, really important back in the days when computers had limited amount of RAM. Um, how many of you remember running on a computer with, you know, one gig of RAM? And that was like a screamer? Because that gig of RAM cost a thousand bucks. I remember those days. Um, I remember the first time I saw a stick of RAM, for like one gig stick of RAM for 45 bucks, I was amazed. Um, and now you can get, what, an 8 gig stick for 40 bucks? Last time I checked. So, real RAM is better than swap space. Regardless why, it's fast. No matter how fast your hard drive is, it's never going to be as fast as the RAM in your machine. If it has to keep swapping, you're going to lose some performance there. Even if you have fast hard drives like an NVMe drive or an SSD, it's still not as fast as real RAM. But if you've got a spin disk, you're going to suffer. You're going to hate your life the entire time you're swapping. So you're better. Here's, here's where I usually give my pro tip. When people say, do I really need to have the minimum standard that the course asks for? Yeah, get that 16 gigs of RAM. You won't hate yourself as much, especially when you start loading up Oracle. And Microsoft SQL Server on the same machine. I'm not calling out to the database course at all. Now, this partition's invisible. The only thing that sees it is the kernel. When Linux first boots, it scans the hard drive, looks for a swap partition, says, hey, I've got a swap partition. And away it goes. And it uses that. You can have up to 64 swap partitions mounted at any time. This was used so you could shove a swap partition on every hard drive so that you could read and write from each of those swap partitions in parallel so that you could read from two places at once instead of everything lined up down one pipe. You had multiple pipes coming in and out. Thus, it was a little bit faster. People were trying to make up for the fact that the hard drives are terribly slow. And there's a command called free. It tells you how much swap space you have available. If I come here and I type in free, you'll see that I've got um, 1.9 gigs of RAM. 204 megs is used, 364 megs is free. As you can see, that does not add up to 1.9 gigs. Because there's 1.3 gigs used for buffer and cache. My swap file, on the other hand, is 974 megs with 6.3 megs used. It even shows here that two gigs of RAM really isn't that much. It's actually more than enough to run most Linux operating systems. Mind you, the version of Linux I'm running here is headless. In other words, I don't have the graphical UI you guys are all used to seeing running. I've killed that. Mine just boots straight to a command prompt. <coughs> it makes things a little more responsive for these demos. All right. I'm going to go through these slides real fast because they're kind of history lessons. And there's not much to say about them. 
ext2 stands for the second extended file system. Like that's an original naming convention. A convention. It came out in 1993. It was developed to overcome limitations of the original ext file system. Surprise. It cannot journal. Um, I'll explain what journaling is in a minute. Um, if you're using flash drives, they recommend ext2, um, so that you don't have to have the overhead of journaling. Mind you, this, these slides were written when USB 1.1 was the hot shit. So we're now in USB, you know, what is it? USB 3.1 Gen 2 Revision 1. For those of you that don't know what that means, that means you can now power a 4K monitor through a USB port. Whereas back then you did well to copy a one megabyte file in three seconds. So, you know, the performance has significantly gotten better. Um, Maximum overall file size is uh, somewhere from 16 gigs to two, 2 terabytes, depending on the disk. And a XT2 file system can be from 2 terabytes to 32 terabytes, again, depending on what kind of disk it's on. If it was on the old style spin disks with the parallel connector, you were limited to 2 terabytes, even though 2 terabyte drives actually never existed with that format, but that was the limit you had. And then... In 2001, they came out with the XT3, which stands for the third extended file system. So, so original. Um, it came out with kernel 2.4.15. It was basically made deep by default. Um, XT3, the big feature of XT3 was that it was journaling. So what happens is it writes the changes to a file. And then it takes those changes and actually writes them to the real files. So it has a space on the hard drive reserved for writing changes really fast. Then when it's time to commit them, it takes them from that and writes them to the real file later. S some people wonder, well, what's the point of writing the data twice? The perk is that when it, if your computer shits the bed while it's writing to the files, odds are what was written quickly is still good. And when it reboots, it'll actually rebuild the rest of the transactions and finish writing it out. Um, it's basically, it's designed to make your file system resilient. Um, when the Windows file system has had this for since Windows NT4, which back then you were probably using Windows 98 SE, which you were used to having your computer crash and it coming up and saying, no, I can't play now. Uh, Linux was terrible for that with ext 2 You'd have a power outage, and they would come up and saying, file system is corrupt. Press control D to go into recovery mode. And then you'd cry for hours while you fixed your disk. Um, EXT3 fixed a lot of that. Uh, what's cool is you can go from EXT2 to EXT3 directly. You don't need to do a backup or restore. You just change a few settings, and magically, you have journaling. You can't go the other way, but you can go 2 to 3 easily. Uh, file size limitations were the same. Nothing there changed. Then ext4 came out. Anybody want to guess what ext4 stands for? <laughs> the fourth extended file system. Came out in 2008. Came out with their kernel 2619. The big perks of it was huge file sizes and file system sizes. Um, an individual file can go up to 16 terabytes. The Maximum size for an ext4 file system is technically one exabyte. One exabyte is 1,024 petabytes. One petabyte is 1,024 terabytes. It's two orders of magnitude larger than a terabyte drive. Um, it's very, very big. It's, yeah, I'm not even going to make the prediction that we'll never see that much storage disk space available to us as an individual in our lifetimes, but because, you know, I started with computers where they had 30 gig, uh, 32 megabyte hard drives and stuff, but I don't see that anytime soon. It's coming, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. Uh, but uh, who knows? There might be a, a big change in the next 10 years. I mean, if you ever told me... 20 years ago that the hard drive in my laptop would be faster than the RAM in my computer at the time, I would have thought you were out to lunch. But the, RAM, the hard drives in this laptop are faster than the RAM was in my first computer. So, you know. Um, 
And you can have up to 64,000 subdirectories as opposed to 32,000. They basically took everything and doubled it. And you can mount an EXT2 file system and turn it into EXT4. Again, it'll go straight up, upgrade in place. Um, it picked up better performance. It was a lot faster than EXT3. They improved how the journaling worked. Um, and EXT4, you can choose to turn off the journaling. So you can still have the big, huge files, but not have the safety net that it provides. That's up to you. Um, there's advantages to that. If you have a flash drive, you probably don't want journaling on your flash drive because how big is your flash drive really going to be compared to, you know, the size of your hard drive? Um, now, Linux can read the following file systems. EXT2, or obviously EXT, 3 and 4, NFS. That's network file system. It allows you to mount a remote partition on a different computer and mount it as a directory on your machine. Um, if you want to talk about seeing servers hang, that's the, 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 the file system that does it. Because if it's designed to mount that file system and the other server's not available, the, the whole machine hangs. It's not a, it's not a fun time. Uh, MS-DOS, surprise, you can read FAT partitions. Uh, you can read VFAT, also known as FAT32, NTFS. If you have a Windows computer, congratulations. Linux can read your partition. HPFS. Again, that's OS2's file system, best operating system ever. Too bad it never went anywhere. Um, ISO 9660, most people don't even know what that is. That's also known as a CD-ROM. Not a DVD. 640 megabyte or 700 meg disks. And the file system was called ISO 9660, and that made sure that it worked in everything. Um, system V, that's the original Unix file system. AT&T created Unix way back in the day, Bell Labs. And Linux can read that original file system from the 60s. HFS, not Mac OS X file system. Talking the old Macs. You know, the iMac, the colorful, the, the gumdrop Macs. Um, QNIX, QNIX 4. Um, again, QNIX out in, in uh, Canada. Real-time OSs. Um, if you have a Ford, your stereo is, and it's a modern Ford, your stereo is running QNX. Uh, if it's a BMW, it's running QNX. Uh, nuclear reactors are running on QNX, just so you know. Um, so are pretty much every Canadian warship. So all our boats are running QNX on a distributed Unisys system. It's kind of cool. Um, NCPFS, and then there's a bunch more. NCPFS is dead as a doorknob. Uh, Novell is long gone. He used to be the king of the land. Now it's not, it no longer exists. All right, FDisk. For those of you that have started doing lab five and six, you've played with FDisk. It is not the most user-friendly command in the world. Um... It is command line partition table tool. You can modify and exist, modify and play with existing partitions. Um, you can read and access most common file systems in use today. So I type in fdisk slash dev slash sda. So I'm accessing the first drive in my computer. M is for help. Why not H? I don't know. M. I guess for man. And you got the usual commands in here. Delete, list, add, print, change, verify, print information. Um, M is for menu, I guess, in the end. They used to not actually have M listed in here, so I never knew what the M stood for. M is for menu. Um, and a couple of other things in here, too, that you'll see. But the very 
two most important commands is below save and exit. W and Q. You can sit there and do your entire lab and not hit W. Guess what happens? It's nothing. It just discards all your changes. M several students have done this every term. I always have a good chuckle when a person sits there and they go, what happened? Nothing worked. Well, let me tell you, son or daughter, you forgot to save your changes. And there's a few special partition types uh, at the bottom. Uh, you can change the style. So you can change it to a DOS partition table type, which is O. And that one is what was the original partition type table that you used to have. Why is it O? Because it's the original. It's a pretty bad, but that's what it was. Uh, G is for the G GPT. Uh, that's the new secure boot partition types. So if I go P to print my partition table, you'll see that I have a Linux partition, an extended partition, and a swap partition. So the SDA1 has a flag of boot, so you can see the asterisks. <coughs> it shows where it starts, where it ends, how many sectors, how big it is, what the file system ID is. 83 is Linux. SDA2 is an extended partition, and my swap partition is in the extended partition. That's actually the thing Ubuntu does. I don't know why, but that's just like how Ubuntu likes to roll. It likes putting its swap partition inside the extended partition. I don't know why. It's just what it does. That's Ubuntu. Fedora doesn't do the same thing. Go figure. Um, as you'll see at the bottom where it says Linux swap slash Solaris type 82, it's gotten to the point where they ran out of bits to identify all the partition types. So what they do, they started doubling up on them. And for some unknown reason, the Linux guys thought it was a great idea to use the same partition type as Solaris. But they're not using it as their primary partition type, they're using it as their swap space. So in theory, you shove a hard drive into one of these hard drives into a, a, a Solaris workstation, and it sees that partition, it's gonna think it's actually a partition it can work with. It can't but it thinks it is. L will show you all the partition types it knows. As you can see, it goes from 0, 0, well, just 0, to FF. And these are all the different file systems that F, this version of FDisk can write. And there's some old ones in here. For example, CPM. This was supposed to be the OS that was supposed to be there instead of DOS. There was supposed to be an OS before DOS. And IBM screwed up and basically Bill Gates won. Um, BSD is Unix. BOS was what the Mac OS was supposed to be. It never lasted. Uh, speed, these speed store ones you see peppered in around everywhere, those are um, backup devices. QNIX. QNIX is weird that way. Do you notice QNIX 4, QNIX 4 second part, QNIX 4 third part? With the way QNIX is set up that each partition has to have its own file system identifier. That's how it actually knows its own partitions. Um, there's a couple on the left called AIX. That's um, IBM's Unix. Amazing Unix. It's free. The computer to run it on will cost you about 100,000 bucks. The OS is free. The computer is not. No, it will not run on your computer. Don't even bother. Um, yeah, unless you're running uh, Power PC chips, it's not going to run on your computer. And there's a bunch of others in here, mix match. Uh, DR DOS, that was the competitor to DOS. Um, completely DOS compatible, but it was there. And then you got, you know, a bunch of FAT16, FAT32. Opus, that's from VAX. 
another very really old computer. Some cool stuff in here. Um, it has too many levels, FDISC. It has general functions and advanced, func advanced functions. Um, I always recommend don't go play with the advanced functions unless you really know what you're doing. I've been playing with Unix and DOS and Linux for years, and I'd never touched the advanced menu. I've only ever had to go into it once, and I was following a tutorial line by line. Um, this is literally for people that know what they're doing, uh, usually for system recovery type work. Now, partitioning is dangerous, just so you know. If you're not careful, you can completely cook your computer. I figured that one out when I got my very first PC and I wiped my hard drive. We didn't have internet. I didn't know what I was doing. I just started typing commands and I wonder, wonder, wonder what this does. I have my DOS book and I didn't even know what these words meant. Like it's like, do you ever see that meme of I know some of these words? Yeah, that's exactly, I think I recognized like one word out of four. I was learning the hard way. Uh, the very first day I learned, I had my computer learn how to partition a hard drive and reinstall DOS and Windows because the store was closed. So that being said, be careful when you play with FDisk. That's why we're all using virtual machines for our lab because at worst you're going to pooch your virtual machine and not your workstation, um, which is good. That's also why we made you clone your VM at the start of the term. Because when, if you pooch it, you can always launch your clone and start over again. By the way, if you screw up your first image, clone your second image before you start to lap again. Just saying. And yes, usually I have one or two out of the whole group every term that doesn't pay attention and they end up wiping parts of their partitions out on their VM. And once I had one student try to be clever and he decided he was going to do his labs on his Linux laptop. And he was actually not paying attention that day because he, I know what I'm doing. The neck beard was strong that day. And uh, then I laughed because I warned him not to do that. So, enough said there. So, there's a few steps you have to follow when you create a usable file system. And these are all the same steps. So, this is where I give you guys a heads up for the final exam. Okay, you haven't had your midterm yet. This is where I give you a heads up for the final exam. These next couple of slides, memorize them. Memorize the order that they're in. Because there's a few questions that ask you, you know, which one happens first. So, step one, you have to prepare the drive. Anybody here ever get involved in building a house or building like a shed or a garage or building something outside? Building something in your house doesn't count. Well, I guess we could go with that. IKEA furniture is as bad as building a house. You want to build a piece of IKEA furniture, the first thing you've got to do is prepare your work area, right? Move everything else out of the way so you have somewhere to work. That's essentially what you're going to do with the partition table is you're going to prepare the drive, create the partitions it needs. So I am going to go through this, but what I'm going to do though is make sure I don't do it on my primary disk. So I'm going to go to my second drive and I'm going to print my partition table list and my partition table list is empty. Good for me. So I am going to create a partition, which would be the FDisk command. Look at the menu. Once again, I'm going to add a new partition. It's going to ask you, what type do you want? Primary, extended. It says you got four free available slots. So I'm going to want to do a primary partition. It's going to be partition number one. You can choose to make it not partition number one. And I always accept the first sector. Now, there once was a day that we couldn't do this. Plus 200 megabytes. We actually had to sit there with a calculator and figure out what the next sector was. So we, if we knew the drive was two gig and we had 4,194,303 sectors, 
we had to take, you know, our two gig divided by that. That would tell us actually how much room we had. And then we could play the math of how much each sector gave us in Ks. And then keep multiplying until we had the space we want. And we always got it wrong. This is much more useful. 200 meg partition. Boom. Okay. So far, my partition has been created. I can go P to print. And it shows. I have a 200 megabyte partition. Congratulations. I have been successful. However, for the ones that giggled earlier when I said, make sure you write your changes before you quit. Because if I, let me quit right out now. And then I go back into here. My partition is gone. Just saying. New primary partition one. 200 meg. Okay. Now, if I wanted to change the partition type, I could hit T and change it to something else. And how do you know which one you want it to be? You list the partition types. And as you can see, 83 is for Linux, 82 is for swap. And if I print, it defaults to Linux, so I don't need to do any other changes. I'm going to write my changes. So now it wrote the changes to my partition table. It calls IOCTL. IOCTL is a special process instead of Linux that it's basically IO control. And the I, when you call the IO control command, it gets fed a parameter that tells it, go reread all the partitions. That way, Linux now is now aware that these partitions exist. So now if I were to go ls, Here's my SDB, and here's SDB1, the one I just created. It now exists. If you remember earlier, if I were to scroll far back enough, SDB1 would not be there. I just created this new room in my house. So that's creating your partition. So that's lab five, more or less, if I remember right. Now, I've created a room. <coughs> Picture this almost like when you instantiate a variable and you set it to be null. What's inside the variable when it's null? Yes. Actually, it's more than nothing. It's the absence of value. Right? A null is not the same thing as nothing. Because a string can be empty and be nothing. A null is an absence of value. Currently, there is an absence of file systems in this. The partition exists. This room is completely empty and void. There's nothing inside of it. It exists. The OS knows it's there. It can't do crap about it. So what's the next command you'd do? Make file system. So for those of you that have played in DOS and PowerShell, you probably remember the command called format. This is format for Linux. And there's actually a few shortcuts in these. And so I can go, well, let me make this a little bit bigger. Make file system, type ext4 slash dev slash sdb1. So what that'll do, it'll format that partition. And now this partition isn't empty. Sorry, it doesn't have a lack of value, an, an absence of value. It is now empty. You can put stuff in it. You just don't have access to it. Now, and the good news is they finally added something really, really important in the last couple of years. Anyone want to take a guess what was the really important thing that they just added? Yes. Linux and Unix are notorious for not warning you. It doesn't tell you you did a good job either. It just does it. The only time it tells you you did something wrong, it tells you anything, is when you did something wrong. The good news is, and I said yes. So now it creates my file system, gives it, this UUID thing is a fairly new thing. That's a unique identifier. So now what happens is the way computers boot nowadays, they don't, your hard drives don't always answer in the right order. 
Um, something actually I didn't know was a thing until not that long ago. And your primary partition may not always, like the first hard drive to answer may not always be the one you want to boot off of. So what's happened is in most Unix-like file systems, and Windows does this too, it actually gives the file system a UUID. It pulls all the UUIDs and it finds the one it's supposed to operate off of. So it uses that UUID, which means uh, universal unique identifier, by the way. Uh, under Windows, there's also known as uh, GUIDs, Global Unique Identifiers. And it's a unique string. The odds of it ever being duplicated are pretty much non-existent. Um, it allocates the group tables, sets up the inodes, sets up the journal, writes it out, and done. So I just formatted it. If I wanted to, I could use a shortcut for this. Like such. There is a bunch of MKFS shortcuts. Again, exact same thing. And if you're curious which ones we have, these are all the M M MKFS shortcuts. You can see there's uh, ext3, fat, msdos, vfat, ntfs, and a couple of others. So I formatted my partition. The next thing you should do is make sure your partition actually was created properly. Normally, it's safe to assume it's created properly, but anybody here ever experienced bad sectors on hard drive? When your old spin disks slowly start to die and part of the hard drive is no good anymore, you want to you end up running a check disk under Windows and it keeps telling you that there's more and more you know, your hard drives eating itself for breakfast. FSCK allows you to double check that. So I can go and it says it's clean. Normally you want to tell it the type, but it's going to amount to the exact same result in the end because ext2, 3, and 4 are basically identical except some of them have extra features. So my partition is clean. It is safe to use. The next thing you're going to do is a mount. And the real lecture 6, which is coming up right after this, so I can be where I'm supposed to be, talks about the mount. And then you will mount. And you can actually add the file system to the etcfs tab file. You can get it to mount automatically if you want. That's how you get Linux to automatically mount other disks. So if I go, and I'm going to create a new directory here. Just so you guys know, it's there. You can see I've got three directories. SDB1 is empty. If I go mount, Now, this is what throws people off for a loop. I just ran a command and it didn't say anything. Anybody want to take a guess what happened? It worked. It doesn't tell you, you did a good job. So when you run a command like this and you don't get any feedback, it probably worked. Did it do what you wanted it to do? Not always. But it definitely did do something. Now, if I go into SDB1, you'll see there's a lost and found folder. Because, you know, Linux file systems have a lost and found folder. That's where if your file system gets corrupted, that's where it puts the files that it detects that were corrupted. Now, if I type in just the mount command by itself, holy crap, that's a lot. All right. These are every file system that's currently mounted. However, the only important ones... <coughs> Um, actually, let me go Actually, I'm going to go SD instead. 
There we go. And let me clear the screen because there's too much noise. So in that whole list of mount, when you type in the mount command, it shows you every file system that is currently mounted by the OS. And some of these file systems aren't really file systems. They're actually processes in memory. And it actually mounts them as a directory. However, these are the real mounts. So we have SDA1, which is mounted as my root. You have this weird one right here. If you're not in VMware, you'll never see this. Um, VMware allows you to share folders between your host OS, like Windows, and your client OS, in this case Linux. So you can actually mount folders from Windows inside your Linux machine. Vice versa. And the last one would be this one down here. Down here. This is the one I just created. And you can see there's some slightly different uh, parameters. SDA1 set to mount, read-write, uh, relative time. On error, it remounts read-only. In other words, if it boots and it detects there's something wrong with the file system, it mounts it read-only, so you cannot damage it. Uh, and I don't remember what the last option does. So the other thing you can do is when you create a swap partition, you create a partition, set it as a swap, so if you do MK swap, it creates a swap partition. Swap on, guess what? It turns it on. Swap off, turns it off. So you can add temporary memory to your computer by creating extra partitions. So when you mount a file system, in Windows, you guys are used to seeing a drive letter show up. In other words, you know you plug in your flash drive, you get like a drive E, a drive F. If you had a CD ROM drive in your machine, how many of you actually have a CD drive in your machine? Wow. That, well, you know, about five years ago, that would have been everybody in the room, right? You have an old computer. <laughs> when you put in a CD or DVD, it shows up as usually drive letter D or E or whatever. If you mount a network drive, it'll show up as another letter. Windows, every time you mount a file system, Windows gives it a letter. That's how Windows behaves. It is actually, believe it or not, slower to mount that way than it is under Linux. Um, in Linux, file systems are mounted as they're needed. So you don't need to have them mounted all the time. You just mount them as you go. Um, so if you plug in a flash drive and you're not using the graphical UI for Linux, so whether you're using um, Ubuntu with a graphical UI or Fedora with a graphical UI or insert Linux flavor here with a graphical UI, you plug in a flash drive, it's not going to mount it for you. You actually have to tell it to mount it. That means that it's, it's going to perform better because it's not constantly looking at every peripheral on your machine and whether or not it needs to be mounted. But it's not user convenient because it doesn't do it automatically for you. That's a trade-off. Um, I just fin literally finished talking about this. Um, now I showed you guys the mount command, and the next set of slides is about this. So in Linux, what's different though, because it doesn't give it a drive letter, when you mount, you mount it to a directory. So you create an empty directory, it's known as a mount point. And then you mount it to that mount point, and magically, you now have you know, a file system. And you're actually accessing multiple partitions, but it looks like you're just part of the same file system. So imagine in Windows, if you were to plug in a flash drive, but instead of showing up as, say, letter drive E, it shows up as a folder under C. So it'd be C colon backslash flash drive. That's how Linux behaves. So whenever you mount a new file system, it gets mounted at a directory, not as a new drive. It's good and bad at the same time, because it gets hard to find out what's mounted. Um, but at the same time, it's good because your scripts don't really need to know about other drive letters because it's just a directory somewhere on the file system. So all file systems that are mounted on Linux exist somewhere under root. They can be mounted manually. They can be mounted automatically. That's what the FS tab is for. 
Um, and again, basically put the last point, iterates the first point. Whenever you want to mount something, it has to be somewhere under the root. Um, I'm going to just go pull open this FS tab. And as you can see, it shows the UUID. Remember earlier when I was talking about the UUIDs? It uses the UUID to actually identify the disk, the partition I want. It tells it where it's going to get mounted, what type it is, what the rules are for mounting, and a few other arguments after that. And uh, you can see I have a dev SDB1 in here, but I have commented it out so that it doesn't mount when I, after I nuke all the partitions because bad things happen. <coughs> it just kind of hangs there trying to mount something that doesn't exist. And this is a graphical representation of how the Linux would see it. All right. I'm going to jump right into 6. This one's real short. It's pretty short, so. Okay. This basically this whole set of slides talks about FS tab. So I was picking up right where the other one ended. And FS tab is the file system table. And it's basically the static information about your file system. Um, if you want to mount something but it's not listed in FS tab, you have manually have to tell it what everything is and what the rules are. It uses the mount command. And here's a series of examples. This is the old way of doing things where you'd actually give the partition number. But nowadays, like I said earlier, sometimes computers boot so fast that the actual drive letter order changes. We have actually this problem at work with one of our machines. We have a uh, machine that runs several VMs, and each of the VMs is on a dedicated hard drive. The problem is that I can't get it to launch the VMs automatically because the drive letters actually change. The drive numbers change depending which one responds first to the kernel, which is a pain. So you could use a UUID to mount it. So in the FS tab, you got six fields. Field one describes the device to be mounted. This is field one. The device to be mounted can be defined two different ways. You can feed it a UUID like that. Or let me just uh, uncomment this so it lights up. There we go. Or you can define it by the actual partition name. Field two tells it where is it supposed to get mounted. So you will see that this one gets mounted right to the root, because that's my root file system. The primary file system, my Linux system, goes to root. This is a swap file, swap partition. It doesn't get mounted, so it mounts to none. It cannot be mounted. MNT new is if I were to mount, if I were to reboot my Linux machine right now, SDB1 would get mounted to slash mount slash new. The next parameter is the file system. So here you see ext4, swap ext4. Uh, if I had a Windows disk in here, you'd see it as NTFS or FAT32 or something else. Um, the next argument is the number, the, uh, the options. So this one is on errors, remount read only so that you can't damage it if their disk is damaged. Field 5 is used by some utilities to determine if it needs to be backed up. And if you don't feed it, it assumes 0. 0 means it doesn't need to be backed up. And if you have a value greater than 1, that means you can go 1, 2, 3. And if you run the backup command, It'll actually look for, it'll look through the FS tab and actually look at the file systems in the order that they're listed and back them up in that order. <coughs> By the way, almost nobody uses has been dump anymore for backups because that backs up the entire hard drive. So if you've got a hard drive with 10 gigs worth of data, you're doing a 10 gig backup every night. That's not how it's done anymore. We use something like called rsync and we just remote sync part of the drives to another drive somewhere else way faster. 
Field six is to determine the order that the file system checks are done at boot. So sometimes when the computer boots up, every once in a while it'll do a check disk. This will tell it what order to do the check disk in. Uh, if they're all set to zero, it goes with the first one listed, works its way through, but you can go zero, one, two, three, and it'll actually check them in that order. Um, as you can see, that's the continuation of field six, which I already described. So a few of the options you have is auto means it can be mounted and automatically gets the file system. Um, no auto means it, can, it has to be mounted manually. So it can never be mounted automatically. So auto will make it, when a computer boots up, it'll try to mount that partition right away so it's there. So imagine in your Windows computer you have two hard drives, like mine has two hard drives. And my D drive was not available unless I told it to make it available every time. Nobody can see drive D unless they know they need to go look for drive D and then mount it. That's what no auto means. Exec means you're allowed to run programs. You can actually tell it to, that it's not allowed to run programs, which is cool. So you can even set the permissions for the files to be executable. It won't let you run the files. Anybody want to take a guess why that's a good thing? Denying permissions for files to be run. Anybody want to take a guess? Eh? No, but yes. Because if you're in that situation, you should have been protected from yourself. Usually it means you're dealing with somebody's computer has been um, either infested with a virus or there's a backdoor or a Trojan or a rootkit. Linux, that's the big baddie in Linux land. It's known as a rootkit that's been installed and you need to clean it up. And if you can't execute any of the programs, therefore the application, the, you know, the different programs can't infect you if you can't run them. RO means read only. RW means read write. No user means an ordinary user cannot mount a file system. That means if you say no user, only root can mount the file system. If you go dash user, any user can mount it. However, it has to be the same user that unmounts it, or you have to be root. So if I have permissions to mount a file system and I mount the file system, he can't unmount the file system. But he could if he's root. If you go users, anybody can mount and unmount. And then there's some defaults you can give it. Now, file systems don't need to be listed in the FS tab to be mounted. Having them listed makes things easier. Um, if you go to mount, the first thing it does, it looks in FS tab, see if it's there. Uh, file systems are mounted and are not mounted at startup. So that one you can actually go and mount the ones that aren't mounted automatically. Um, otherwise, you have to mount them by hand. There's an awful lot of words for what I can say in a sentence on these slides. Now, UUID is something that's fairly recent. Universally unique identifier. And Linux, since in the last four years, I'd say, five years, has started depending on UUIDs a lot more than they used to. Um, which is good, because this means you can now change the hard drives, change what, what port they're plugged into, and Linux won't care, because the partitions are uniquely identified. It has nothing to do with the disk it's on, you can actually literally take a partition from one disk, put it on another disk with the same UUID, and Linux will still know it exists. Um, that, like it says now, that makes no difference if you change, add, remove hard drives. The mount points aren't going to get changed. <coughs> uh, usually you want to use UUID instead of the old way of doing it. Um, because, well for obvious reasons. If you actually want to know what the UUIDs are, uh oh Guys, if I go BLKID, you'll see there's a unique identifier for that partition, the file type, and then the partition's UUID. 
You can ask for a specific one. So if I went, I can just ask for the one. I mean, whatever. It's all the same. So the mount command, which I actually just finished demonstrating already, um, it lists all the currently mount, mounted file systems. If you go mount-a, it will try to mount all file systems that aren't currently mounted that are in FS tab. Mount-a means stands for all. Mount all known file systems. That can be dangerous. Uh, you can choose to mount a specific device. So if the de device or the partition is defined in the FS tab, I can just go mount slash MNT slash floppy. So if I go So earlier, I know that new was defined. Oh, hang on. I didn't save my changes. So I could go mount new. It doesn't complain. But if I go into new, there's my lost and found. Because that partition of SDB1 is listed in the FS tab, <coughs> and it's listed that it's supposed to mount to mount new, it's able to go and mount. It guesses it automatically. If it's not listed in FS tab, you have to give it all the arguments. Uh, usually it's safe to tell it what type it is so that, because it'll detect the lowest common type that works. So if it's an ext4 file system, it may still mount it as ext2 because that's the lowest compatible file system for it. So you want to mount it, you tell it the type with dash t, the next argument is the device or the partition number. And does this give you an idea how old these slides are? Slash dev slash FD0. How many people here have an FD disk on their laptops? I haven't seen one of those on a laptop in 17 years. It's a floppy drive. Yes, we used to actually have floppy drives on our laptops. That's before we got hard drives, I mean uh, CD-ROM drives on our laptops. This is mounting a floppy disk. It's just going to show this has not changed in years. And you can feed it some arguments like dash O for read only. That way you can, let's just say you're doing some forensic analysis on a, someone's hard drive. By forensic analysis, I mean you're trying to look for blackmail material. Or you work for the cops and you're trying to find evidence. That's, there's two ways of describing forensic evidence. You'll want to mount that drive read-only so you don't accidentally damage it. If it's read-only, that means you can't write any changes, you can't delete files, you can't rename files, the OS can't nuke files on it, that kind of stuff. U-mount um, means unmount. Uh, sometimes we'll get a message that says device is busy. That usually means something is accessing a, a file or something else on that mounted device. Um, the most common mistake is to unmount the current directory. So right now I'm in new. If I go you mount, you'll get target is busy. If I come out of there and do this again, now it works. Picture it this way. You're trying to knock down a house while you're standing inside of it. Linux is smart enough to not let you knock down the house while you're standing inside of it. You're outside of it. Uh, there are a few restrictions. You cannot mount two file systems to the same spot. That's just, that, there's not a lot of other way I can explain that. Um, If ever you've actually explored the whole concept of teleportation, you'll know what I'm talking about when you say that two things can oc cannot occupy the same space. Because bad things happen when two things occupy the same space. Things go boom. Um, Linux is smart enough to not let you have two things occupy the same space. So you can only mount something in one spot. The directory must exist before you try to mount. It won't mount to a non-existent place because it doesn't exist. Um, 
The user mounting the file system has access rights to the mount point and the mount command. That means that you have to have permissions to the mount point. So if it's slash mount slash something, you have to have permissions to actually use that subdirectory. And you have to have permission to actually use the mount command. That's one of the safest ways to avoid users damaging their disks is to take away their rights to mount stuff. Now, this is the weird one. When you mount a file system into a directory that already has stuff, it does not erase that stuff. Let me demonstrate. OK, SDB1 is not mounted. So I'm going to go into new. See, there's a folder. I'm pointing at this screen like you can see it. See, there's a folder called test. You can see right there it says test, right? If I were to go back up and go mount new, now you don't see test. It says lost and found, because lost and found is in that partition you mounted. It's a weird quirk of the Linux operating system. So if you've got an entire directory structure, and it exists, and then you mount a file system on top of that directory structure, that those files don't go away. They still exist. It's just now the operating system is now being redirected somewhere else. So it's as if you were going to go out that door, but instead of going out that door, you suddenly teleport out into the cafeteria. Because I mounted the cafeteria to that door. And then I unmount the cafeteria, and then you can step out, and you're back in the hall again. The hall still exists. I'm just changing the meaning of what that door is. So when you mount a partition onto a directory, you're changing the meaning of what that directory actually is. It's pointing to somewhere else. Um, the only really way to understand this is to play with it until you, you understand it. Um, but there's been all kinds of you know TV shows and sci-fi shows that talk about that. Oh, they open the door and they're in a different place. Uh, Doctor Who was big on that whole topic. Yeah, the Matrix, the door guy. Who said the Matrix? You. Remember the key, the key, the the was it the key, uh, the key master. You know, he opens a door, it goes somewhere else. He opens the same door, it goes somewhere else. The mount point does the same. Mount command does the same thing. This door normally goes to here. Key master put, turns a key, it's going somewhere else. He takes the key out, it's going back to where it was. Perfect example. I'm actually, I should have used that because I watched that like two weeks ago again. Okay, so that's the end of these slides. Once again, as a reminder, the test is next week. It's closed book. I've put up practice questions on Brightspace. They are available to you now. They're set to be timed. So you have a real experience of what it's actually going to be like, timing-wise. <coughs> it is multiple guess. No, you don't get a cheat sheet. No, you don't get to talk to your neighbor. No, you don't get to use insert text messaging client here. I don't want to see your phone either. I don't care. I just don't want to see your phone. Uh, if you need to keep time, bring in a good old-fashioned analog watch or digital watch. Smart watches are not allowed either because I've seen people sit there, text, get their friends text them answers on their smart watch, and they scroll through the answers. Yes. Yeah, lectures one to four. Um, I don't do lecture five. Yeah, I used to do lecture five, but every once in a while something goes horribly wrong and I don't cover all the material I need. So I'd rather stop at four. That way I know for a fact I'll have time to cover it before you guys have to take the test. And this year it's a little weird because reading week is a week later than it normally would be. As some of you have noticed, normally reading week's like the third week of February. For some unknown reason it's the fourth week of February this year because normally today would be the day you're writing that test. Because it's the week before reading week, but this time reading week's a week later, so it kind of kind of screwed everything up for me. Forty? I have to double check. It's not a big test. I'll go double check and I'll send it out and I'll put it in the announcements. Now you get the whole two hours. You come in, you do the test, you leave, and you're done for the day. There's nothing, just lectures one to four. <laughs>
No, no file system. No.